If you are interested in leadership, of course, you're in the right place. But if you love football, you will not want to miss this episode. We're talking about football and leadership both on episode 142 of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Let's go. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to talk about leadership, teamwork, organizational culture, and human potential with experts from every walk of life. Your host is Kevin Eikenberry, a best-selling author and leadership thought leader for 25 years. This episode is sponsored by Kevin's book, The Long Distance Leader, Rules for Remarkable Remote Leadership. Order your copy today at remarkablepodcast.com forward slash book. And now, here's your host, Kevin. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Our guest today is Michael Lombardi. Let me tell you about Michael before we dive in. He, is, he was most recently on the coaching staff for Bill Belichick uh, for the New England Patriots front office. He's spent 30 years working for the San Francisco 49ers, the Oakland Raiders, the Cleveland Browns, where he was the general manager for two years. He writes for The Athletic and has a top 10 sports cast called GM Street on Bill Simmons' Ringer Podcast Network. So we got a, we got a football expert with us today, but we also have a leadership expert with us today. Michael, welcome. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I uh, certainly appreciate the leadership part uh, more than just football. Thank you very much. Well, and we're going to talk about both. So for all of you listening who are saying, oh, I'm not a football fan, hang with us. I promise you, you're going to love this. But if you're a football fan, you're going to really love this. I have to. Uh, so first of all, welcome to the other side of the mic. You're usually the guy on my side of the mic. Yeah, I know. I appreciate that too. It's, it's always good. And I, I, I like this arena that you talk about because, it, you know, people, you know, when I first started in the National Football League in 84, uh, Bill Walsh would always say to me, you know, these people that say football is not a business are nuts. And football is a business and you have to run it like a business, which then led us down this path towards leadership and management and all that. So, you know, even if you're not a football fan, football is a business. And if you don't recognize it, you're making a grave mistake. Yeah, and we're gonna and we're gonna dive into all that in a second. I have to just say to anyone listening, if you've just sort of joined us, uh, so Michael, first of all, you're not the first Super Bowl champion that we've had. <laughs> we had we had I I interviewed Gary Brackett. So if any of you want to listen to Gary Brackett, he was episode 97. Yeah, I interviewed Bulls. Kelly yeah. Roach, who is a uh, who is an entrepreneur, but she's also a former Eagles cheerleader. How about that? Wow. So, who knew, right? Who knew? Uh, that was episode 101. And uh, Sam Walker, who anyone who's listening that heard my interview with Sam Walker, who works for the Wall Street Journal, but wrote this great book about what makes great teams great. And it uses the sports piece. Um, I bet, Michael, you'd love his book, um, The Captain's I, Class. I got to get it. I, I it's just, the name of the book, The Captain's Class. <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm confident, Michael, that you would love uh, that book. So there's three people we've had on that have been sports and football related. But uh, so tell us a little bit about it. You said that in, in the intro, I said who all of you sort of work for, but sort of how did you get, I mean, you had this last name of Lombardi, which people right. football, but how did you sort of tell us a little bit about the journey from 1984? Um, well, you know, the journey really started a long time ago. And I think there's a, uh, there's a line in my book. I said, the world gets out of the way for people that know where they want to go. And, and I was fortunate and blessed to know where I wanted to go. And it's really comes back to uh, my last name, Vince Lombardi, the great coach of the Packers. Uh, you know, when I would see him on television, I thought somehow he had to be related to me. There's, he looks like everybody who would attend my Sunday dinners in the family. You know, he fit perfectly. We all had the same noses and we all had the same olive complexion. So, uh, you know, he was really a driving force for my interest and my love of football. And I just made a really... Um, decision that when I was working on the back of my uncle's garbage truck, I realized that I don't want to ever work. I want to enjoy work. I want to enjoy my life. And when you haul trash cans in a, in a beach town in the summertime, which can get rather smelly and, and disgusting, you realize that, you know, there's work and then there's enjoyable work. And I wanted to be a part of it. I wanted to go somewhere where I never felt like I've worked a day in my life. And to this day I haven't. So, uh, and I knew football was going to be the, and football was the place that I thought I could enjoy it. And I just set my path on it. And through the wisdom of Bruce Springsteen that happened to 
write songs in the early 70s about, you know, Born to Run and Cross Highway 9 and Follow Your Dreams, I had a messenger. I had a, I had a voice that was telling me that it's possible because so often in life we get people that tell us you can't do something, you know. And Coach Raveling, the greatest, one of the greatest human beings I've ever met in my life, he's 81 years old. He was the head of basketball coach at the University of Iowa, Washington State, and USC. You know, he, he had three pitchers in his office when he was working for Nike, which he still does. Mm-hmm. And he called them his mentors, and he's never met, he never met any of those. And I think in life, we do have mentors that we never meet. And for me, it was Lombardi and it was Springsteen telling, you know, the passion to go find something. And then Springsteen basically saying, you can do it if you just put your mind to it. And that's how I started my, my journey into the NFL. I was just determined to find a way to get in there. So I would attend coaching clinics throughout the Northeast. Uh, I try to learn as much football as I possibly could. And I was fortunate enough to get an unpaid job at UNLV as an unpaid assistant and all the Burger King coupons I could eat. And uh, I stumbled into a, a job as a 49er scouting assistant in 1984. And that started the journey. And, there, and, and you get to work with Bill Walsh. Yeah, so. yeah then I just wow. stumbled. I mean, you know, it's like, uh, you know, there is things in life that are uh, serendipitous. And certainly, you know, my first day on the job, I mean, there's this legend of a coach with this press shirts and white sneakers that were absolutely perfect and, you know, khaki pants. And, you know, and if a pitcher wasn't hung properly on the wall, he was. I love that story in the book, by the way. Yeah. I mean, I still can't go buy a picture today without if it's not hung on the wall properly. And so he was just in a, and, and then I, you know, I, I, I learned so much from him, but I learned more about, I learned football, but I learned how to apply business to football, I think more than anything. And he set me on this path to Tom Peters, which then led me on to Warren Bennis and Peter Drucker and all those. And speaking of Tom Peters, everyone who's listening, Tom Peters also been a guest here. So like we're going full circle. Speaking of going full circle. Tom Peters is my hero. I mean, I've never met Tom Peters. I've been fortunate enough to, uh, to exchange emails and conversations on Twitter, but I've, I've listened to so many of his seminars and his speeches. Like I, I, Tom Peters is truly a mentor of mine uh, because the book really was at the root of all things came from Coach Walsh asking me a simple question. Do you know who Tom Peters is? And I thought it was a punter from South Dakota, you know, and I had no idea who Tom Peters You're was. You're scanning your memory banks thinking of the Tom Peters punter. Yeah, like, right? is this a trick question, you know? It's like, is he messing with my head here, you know? And so I'm like, okay, yeah, I do know who Tom Peters is. Uh, he's, so obviously this is 1984. I can't go on Amazon or I can't Google him. I, I had to go down to find the nearest bookstore, which there wasn't even, I don't even think there was a Barnes and Noble at this time. I, I li- literally went to a bookstore in Palo Alto and asked the woman if she had any books on Tom Peters. And there was, you know, in search of excellence and search of with Bob Wooderman. And then I started reading that. And then, you know, upstairs in my, upstairs in our den, there's a zillion books that are really, my wife curses because I have too many books, but they're all because of Tom Peters. I blame Tom for everything. All right. Well, listen, I, I, I uh, have had, we had a great, Tom and I had a great conversation here. So we're talking about a, this book keeps showing up. And if you're watching, you can see it. But if you can't see it, I will tell you that it's called Gridiron Genius, a masterclass in winning championships and building dynasties in the NFL. And it is a book about the NFL. But I was so glad, Michael, when we started chatting before, I hit record that you said, hey, this is a this is a leadership book, and to which I heartily agree, and that's where we're going to spend most of our time. But I have to I, I have to geek out on football just a little because no. both Bill Walsh and uh, Bill Belichick, you worked closely with both at different stages in your career, and so and, and Bill and Belichick more than once, as it turns out. Um, so tell me about let, let's just talk about them as leaders. And what would you say are the unique strengths of each of them? How, how, would, you, how would you sort of give us one or two of the greatest strengths of each, that each of them have as a leader? Well, I think they, there's this thing I write about in the book called false duality, which means, you know, most of us in life think about problems and we either think the solution is A or B. And Walsh and Belichick are, are against false dualities. They never look at a problem as if there's an A or B solution. They always find the C, D, E, and F. And 
that's one of their greatest strengths. Both of them are able to do that. They can look at a problem and be creative in thought to solve the problem and also be divergent in thought to solve the problem. Two vastly different things. Most people confuse those two words, but they're vastly different. And so, uh, you know, they share that trait and they sh also share the trait of being able to keep their intellectual capacity going and adapt to the changing times of our lives. I think that's so important. You know, I did a, a TED talk and I, and I talked about how leaders are killing culture. And in that, I, I mentioned that in 1955, of the top 500 uh, S&P uh, Fortune 500 companies, only 60 remain today. However, you know, that, and you would say to me, well, that's fairly easy to explain. Technology, innovation has killed most of them. And yet the reality of it all is, is that today they think in the next 10 years, 250 of the S&P 500 will be gone in the next 10 years that are currently, and we're in an age of technology and innovation. And partly because people don't understand how to keep up with the current times and adapt and to change. I mean, you know, it's the great story of, of Kodak is the first company to find the digital imaging, and yet they confused that they were in the, they thought they were in a camera business and not in the imaging business, and now they're bankrupt, and Google's making all the money off of their, off of their ideas. So I think those two things, and what make Walsh and Belichick so special? Well, and you, you, there's a, there's a piece in the book that you, where you talk about how, and again, I'll, I'll, it's, it's a football history thing. I lived in the Bay Area, some of the same time that you did. So, you know, Montana and Young and all those guys. Uh, so I followed that closely, be, being living out there. Uh, we probably went to some of the same bookstores. <laughs> I'm guessing. Sure. Uh, I was up in in San Francisco, but and nonetheless. The conversation that you that you talk about in the book about the the culture that Bill Walsh created and how it maintained for a while with George Seifert and then it went away as vestiges of that went away. So you know we as leaders are are creating a culture. And one of the things that I got from the book is that Walsh was was completely committed to intentionally building the culture that he wanted. Uh, and and it and it outlasted him, but only for so long, unless someone continues to be intentional. So I've talked long enough. Anything you want to add to that? Well, I think I think that's really the. I think both men, Belichick and Walsh, understood that they not only had to establish culture, they had to drive it and maintain it. And I think you know, culture is like your grass in your front yard. It, it you know, one day it looks beautiful, but if you don't maintain it and 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 adhere to it, it, it can go green. It can go yellow in a hurry. And I think both of them, and so when they left, and so when Walsh left, or assistants leave him, they really didn't understand what he was all about, the, the basic root of what he believed in. You know, we confused a little bit like Kodak. Most people confuse the, the, the Walsh genius and brilliance for his offense when it really was these 17 principles that he believed that the culture and the organization should have. And he believed in it completely. And he made sure that everybody understood those things. And yet, you know, when he leaves, nobody really understands. They just think things are going to stay in place. And, you know, they can't. I mean, you have to be willing to have confrontation. You've got to be willing to, to make decisions that get you back to the root of your culture. And Walsh and Belichick were brilliant at it. And we'll have, time will tell how it maintains after Belichick is gone. I think I know the answer to that. I'm sorry? I think I know the answer to that question. And that is? I don't think it can. I just don't think it will be able to. I think he, I don't think, you know, it's Walsh used to say to me all the time, a guy throws a 65-yard touchdown pass and they don't even understand how they got it. And I'm not sure that most organizations understand the depth and the magnitude that it takes to establish a winning culture of which has happened for over 17 years, seven years in consecutive conference championship games. That's just not an accidental you know, winning story. That's, that's deep dive culture. And it's and not just about a quarterback or. Right. Yeah. It's easy to say it's the quarterback or the coach. No, it's about the culture. And I think that's going to be really hard to duplicate. Okay. So in the book, you, one of the things that struck me is you talk about the five qualities of great coaches and I'd, I'm going to talk, I'm going to bring each one up. I'd like you to talk about them less about football and more about the, the broader okay. thing. I mean, I think it's really interesting for everyone listening. I'll, I'll back up and say that when I started this podcast, I said I want to have on um, leadership experts 
and expert leaders, right? People who have written about it, thinking about it, but also people that are doing it. And so, Michael, I, I look at you and say both. I mean, you were the general manager of an NFL team for two years. Uh, you were in that leadership role at the highest level in an organization. And so I really want to talk about these five qualities and have you talk about them sort of more generally than just football, um, if you can. Uh, so and, and so I'll, I'll read them off and just let you talk about them, if that's okay with you. So the first, there are five of these qualities. I found them really fascinating. The first one is command of the room. Right. You know, that's so important. I, I, you know, I think that it's easy. You know, all this stuff is simple. Einstein has five levels of intelligence that he believed in. And, you know, the, the, the least one was smart. You know, the, the, the fourth one was intelligent. The third one was brilliant. And the second one was genius. And the first one was simple. And, you know, these things that I talk about are really simple and we should all know them, but damn, they're not practiced all the time. So a command of the room is you walk into a room and you have a message, you have a plan. And we've seen some really bad plans people follow in this country over, over the world, in the world. And we've seen some really good plans that people can buy into. And I think that our, as a leader, we sometimes just assume that the people following us know what the plan is. And unless you give them a specific detailed plan on how we're going to achieve success, and it can't be the plan is to win a Super Bowl or the plan is to make money or the plan is to sell the company for $4 billion. No, that's not a plan. That's a goal. You know, and plans aren't mission statements. They're not mission statements. They're, they're detailed. This is how we're going to behave on a single basis. This is how everybody in the organization should operate and work and explain it on a, on a, on a semi-monthly basis to everybody so there's no misunderstanding of exactly the agenda that what we're setting ourselves to do. Perfect. So the second one, they're all, by the way, everybody, they're all commands. So command of the room and then command of the message. This is so important. So this is, and we see this with all kind of leaders. There's a dynamic role in how to explain the plan. And it doesn't have to be you know, you don't have to be Newt Rockney. You don't have to be Lee Iacocca who can speak brilliantly or Barack Obama who's tremendous in front of a, a camera. You have to have your own authentic way of explaining the plan and using metaphors to understand where we're going and let people visualize it. And I talk about, you know, Dr. King, when he stood up on the podium in Washington, D.C. on that hot August day, uh, he was the 16th of 16 speakers that day. He was not the keynote address speaker. And he was only allowed to talk for five minutes. That was the agreement that all the speakers were signed to. And he started his speech. And, and around the five-minute mark, Mahalia Jackson in the background screams to him, tell him about the dream, Dr. King. And then, Do and then Martin, Dr. King goes into the I have a dream section of, the spe of his speech that he gave in Detroit two weeks earlier. And when he was done 11 minutes later, he went over by 11 minutes. Everybody understood what he was talking about through his words. They could visualize the meaning of what he was trying to say. Now, we all don't have Dr. King's oratory skills, but we do have the ability to communicate and have, help people visualize what we're trying to get them to do. That's a powerful tool. The plan, the command of the room is great, but command of the message have to go together. And you've got to work as hard on that as you possibly can. And it can be subliminal. When you walk into the New England Patriots offices, Belichick has four things that he reminds the players of every single day. None of them have anything to do with winning. None of them have anything to do with winning. Not that it's all about what he wants to put in your head constantly. And I think that's part of command of the message. And how you do it has to be your own way. It can't be, I'm going to steal this idea from somebody else. Or No, it's got to be authentic. Perfect. You're heading toward the third command, which is command of self. Yeah, this is a hard one. Most people don't get this one right, you know. And so I think that you say all great leaders should spend time evaluating their self and understanding their strengths and weaknesses and how they can improve. Henry Kissinger said when he went to Washington, he said, you know, when you come to Washington, you borrow on the intellectual power you bring and you can't renew it once you're there. And being a leader is sometimes it's hard on your intellectual power. It's hard to renew it. But you should carve out an hour a day to renew your intellectual capacity. You should carve out an hour a day to strengthen your toolkit on leadership and be self-critical of what you need to work on. And that shows humility. 
that shows transparency and that shows the leadership, the people that are you're leading, that you have vulnerability in your life and that you're willing to accept it. So when you ask somebody else to be willing to accept something, they are more open to it. So, you know, this is a very dangerous slope here because a lot of coaches in any sport don't want to admit mistakes because it makes them look bad. But I think it's a powerful tool. The greatest lessons, the greatest mistakes I've made have been the greatest lessons I've learned. And I think you have to make them to be successful. All right. Uh, fourth is, by the way, everyone who's listening, I hope you're taking notes because you ought to be. And if you're, and if you're watching, if you're listening to this while you're exercising, or whatever, you're going to go back and listen again, because in each of these three so far, I'm confident we're going to get the same in the next two. There's this really powerful stuff that, that, that the command of, self peace michael to me is is so important and it's so important and i'm, you know, I'm working with po folks i'm coaching all the time on that particular one you know i think the biggest mistake we make in in any job we take is we you know you get a you become the president of a company or you become the president uh, of a group or a, a coach you spend every you, everybody wants to know what your first hundred days are you know and I think it's completely wrong. I think what you should do is find out why you got the job. There's a reason you're there. And if you don't do an autopsy of that, you're never going to be able to advance. So you're, you're not coming. Don't think you're coming in as the savior or the, the king of the mountain. Come, think, come in humbly and look back and not be critical of the person that you're replacing, but understand why he couldn't get the job done. And that's Where are we at now, and how do we move forward from there, right? What's which that? Relates to your next one, which is the command, command of the opportunity. Right. Yeah, you, you have to be able to understand what the, you know, where, why you're in the job and why you're there. And you humbly have to understand it. And it isn't because the guy messed up or, you know, he was lazy or whatever. It might end up being that way. But everybody's so looking for what's the next 100 days or the first 30 days or you know, I have a, a document in my computer called First Things First. What would you do first? And first thing I would do is, is find out from every member of an organization why they think it failed. You know, why, why we're in this mess that we're in. You know, why we've been losing. Why haven't we been able to do this? Let, let everybody tell you. Now, I'm not saying because, look, I'm against committee meetings because they've never dedicated a monument to a committee. But I think that's part of gathering information. And that's really the command of the opportunity. And last, you're just talking about a process of, of listening, going on a listening tour is what I call that, Michael. Um, right. Command of the process, last one. Well, you know, I mean, you, the, the process is when you put the plan in, it, it, it requires you to be willing to have confrontation. You know, there's, there, there's this notion in this world that we all have to have collaboration and get along and all that. And I think that's wonderful in rhetoric, but I think there's a time where you've got to be able to say to somebody, this is not working and we have to fix it. Now that doesn't mean everybody should get fired. I think you need to be honest and transparent to tell everybody exactly what you expect of them and how you expect to do it, not micromanage them. And you have to be willing to be honest with them. Look, this doesn't get it done. I think people, you know, when I deal with players, players want the truth. Employees want the truth. They want to know where they are. They want to know where they stand. And if you're not willing to have that hard conversation, then you shouldn't be a leader. Well, and how do you expect someone to grow from where they are if they don't know where they are? And if they don't know what, what, what the bar is that you're, you're trying to get them to, right? I think yeah. it's, it's oh. interesting to me um, how, you know, I, I'm, I'm in rooms with leaders all the time and I try to not use too many sports metaphors because I know not everybody cares. Right. right. But when that, when we get there, then everyone wants to say, well, it's so much easier because they, you know, there's all these th reasons they want to say that it's easier or whatever. I want to, I want to get back to, to that in a second. Um, because I just think it's so interesting that people, everyone wants to say, well, everyone else has it easier in doing this than we do. Uh, not true at all. But, um, there's a section of the book that I found really interesting, and, and I don't really need to spend, we don't need to spend a lot of time there, but if I open up the book, there's this one section that's gray pages rather than white pages, and it's, yeah. um, it's let's see, it's 11 pages long, everybody, and it's called What to Ask an NFL Head Coach Candidate, and right. I was struck 
what I was struck by, well, first of all, as a, an interested party in football, uh, uh, a bunch of questions raised, like I didn't even realize that the coach could have impact on those things. But um, I was struck by the level of detail and the level of specificity in it. And um, I think anyone who's listening, if you're in the mode of hiring, uh, I think it's worth reading the book for that part only, not because you can apply those questions directly, but it gets at the, the clarity that you brought to what all do we need to know so that we've got the right fit. Uh, right. Anything you wanna say about that whole section at all? I just think it was really fascinating. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I think that, you know, uh, it doesn't matter what your field is. I mean, whatever you're trying to find somebody to, you have to write down what you're trying to find is a journey to see how much thought they've given to this promotion that they so desperately want. You know, it's Al Davis used to say to me all the time, who was the owner of the Raiders and a brilliant man, you can't work in the NFL. You have to live in the NFL. And if you want to become a head coach of the NFL, for example, there's only 32 of those jobs. So that's a harder job to get than the United States Senator, essentially. How much time have you spent really thinking about this? And if you can't answer some of these questions, you probably haven't thought enough about it. That you're not really ready, you know? And the questions are mundane and pretty, but they should be thought about. Everything should be buttoned up. And I think at any job, if you want to get promoted, how much time have you spent thinking about what you really want to become? And I'm not saying you should let your job, your ambitions get in the way of doing your job. Not at all. But there's always a, an hour a day of growth. And there's always an hour a day of self-improvement. And in that self-improvement within your hour, are you working on the things that you know you're going to need to have in your toolkit when you go to the next level? Okay, everybody, just to give you an example of the specificity. So it's really not, about, in some cases, I, what I'm hearing you say is, it's not about the answers, it's about that there is an answer and there's a thought process that's there. That's, that's so, really right. I, I don't question. expect anybody to ace the test, but I want to know their thought process behind the test. And if they say to me, you know, I really never thought about that, then I think that you haven't thought about this job enough. You haven't thought about, and so if I give you this job, I mean, are you going to be, are you going to be willing to keep thinking or are you just telling me what I want to hear to get the job? That's, a, that's always a problem. So here's the one that struck me. Just one of many to make the exact point, Michael. Okay. So future head coach, who's the person responsible for assigning Jersey numbers? Like, <laughs> you know, most of us never thought of that. And you're, again, you don't, you, what I'm hearing you say is I don't care. I want to know that you thought about it and why, how did you come to that? point so I, I just thought that whole section well, well I think what it, okay so that's a really that that's a that's a great example so it the answer should be well look uh, say you're you're a 49 you grew up you the Bay Area let's just take the 49ers yep you know who's going to assign jersey numbers okay so are we going to give out 16 are we going to give out 80 are we going to give out 87 are we going to give out you know 42 these are great players numbers from there so the, I, the answer that I would want back, it, it would be, you know, I want to respect the history of the organization. I want to control those numbers because I want players to understand the value behind every number. And I'm going to give that number for a reason because it brings the legacy of our franchise together. It brings the history of our organization together. That's the symbolicism of the numbers. Absolutely. Like there's only one Ronnie Lott, so you better be really. If I give you 42, you have to understand who wore 42. And you got to walk in 42 shoes a little bit. I'm just not going to hand you 42. 42 is a special number. 42 means a lot to this organization. 42 means a lot to me. And so I, I, I've got to be able to do that. Perfect. Hey, I got, I got a question for you uh, that I think. Well, hold on. I got two dogs. One second. That's all right. We're going to just. I'm, I know you'll edit this. He's going he's gonna to take care of that. And, and while he's gone, I'm just going to tell you, everybody, this is the book we're talking about. No, we're talking about the book. The Gridiron Genius, Michael Lombardi. Uh, Bill Belichick wrote the foreword for this book. If you are a football fan, this is a book that you want to read. If you know a football fan, this is a book that they need to read. And quite honestly, um, as I hope you're getting from this conversation, that the reality is that this isn't really a football book. It's the first thing that Michael said to me before we turned on the recording was, this isn't really a football book. And I'm glad you get that, Kevin. Um, so Here's a, here's a question that I, I want to ask you, Michael. So there are a lot of people who are football fans 
who are watching or listening. And my question would be this, um, what is something that the casual fan would be surprised about in, in terms of leadership in the locker room? Well, you know, I think it's a dynamic because, you know, you're, you're talking to a lot of players that perhaps make more money in the locker room than, they, than you make. So you've got to manage, you've got to manage their own ambition and you've got to manage their, uh, where they want to go. I, I, you know, you have to accept that too. And then you have to also understand that the players that you're talking to, and this applies to any businesses, they're millennials. And so do you understand how to deal with a millennial today? Do you understand what their culture is really about? If you want to constantly look at people that you're leading through the eyes of, uh, of your eyes, you, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. You're going to not be able to hit the right chords and command the message properly. You've got to be able to really understand that. And so that locker room is, a, is, a, is part business. It's part fun. It's an area that I would never go into as a general manager because I thought it was a sacred area for the players. You know, they don't want somebody who's controlling their salary to come down into their sacred area, just like I don't expect them to come up to my office. So, but I also have to understand where they came from and what they're about and what their agendas are and accept them. Cool. I, I'm guessing if you're the general manager and you won the Super Bowl, you'd go in the locker room. Oh, I definitely would do that. Yeah. <laughs> On that day, right? Yeah. Uh, so while you've got those rings, you didn't have one as a GM. I don't know, no disrespect there by, by any means, of course. So um, a couple of uh, final things before we go. I'm curious, you know, a lot of people hear um, how all-encompassing the work is in the NFL. I know you're not in the NFL now, uh, but certainly you are a busy guy. You've got a lot going on. And, um, and I'm just curious, what is it that's something that you do personally for fun? Oh, well, you know, I mean, it's, you know, like I said, at the beginning of this, I, I've worked, my whole life has been fun. I mean, I, I just, you know, I think this whole, this whole business that I've been in has been nothing but fun for me. I mean, I've had some really heartbreaking losses and lost jobs and, you know, but at the end of the day, it's been a lot of fun. I think the most fun I have now is a grandparent, you know, my wife and I can enjoy kids at, at, at an age where we're young enough to really enjoy them and, to, kind of uh, spend time with them and learn, you know, because you're so busy doing your job, you sometimes the growth of your own children falls behind. And I think that's probably the greatest time. Coach Rapp, who again is, is my hero, told me this uh, a couple of years ago. He said the best time of his life was when he turned 60 and now he's 81. Those last 20 years have been the most fulfilling. And I think that's really the objective. I have to say, about Coach Raveling, as a Purdue Boilermaker, there were days I didn't necessarily love him when he was at Iowa. But that's a whole uh, – see, you, I'm, I'm Kevin, a Katie guy. You should have, you I just, have Coach Rav on this podcast because I don't know if there's a smarter person in my life that I've ever been around. I mean, I've obviously been around Belichick and Walsh and Al Davis, but I think Coach Rav's wisdom and his humility is something that uh, I, I try to utilize every single day. And his, he always ends the conversation with me, what can I do to help you? And I just find it fascinating. You know, he's, and he means it sincerely. And he's not about, it's not the phony, I'm going to send you a thank you letter. I mean, certainly you get that, but there's a genuineness to what he believes. That's awesome. So uh, the only question in this whole conversation that I prepped you for is this one. And that's, what's something you are reading now or that you would recommend people ought to read? And I know you're prepared for this because you said, oh, Kevin, this is easy. So oh, this one's easy. Yeah. You know, I've always believed in the five book theory where you should, what were the five books you would always re take with you if you were stuck on a desert island? You know, where would you go? And, uh, you know, I'm obsessed with Robert Caro. He's, I'm waiting for his final volume of the LBJ books. Caro's almost been another um, hero of mine because, I mean, here's a man who's written five books in his life. He's in his, he's in his mid eighties. Uh, his first book was on Robert Moses called the power brokers. And then he's done four volumes on LBJ and he writes every day in the fist building in Manhattan. Uh, he has no one help him. He does it by hand and then he does it by typewriter. I mean, he's truly a dedicated, remarkable man who's, uh, whose discipline I admire greatly. So I think that, and then, you know, I got to know David Marinus from, because I was working one day in the, in my office in Oakland and I got a phone call from this guy and he said, I'm writing this book on Lombardi and I wanted to know your relationship with him. And I said, well, I'm not related. And he's, we became friends from that. 
And uh, he wrote that book called When Pride Still Mattered, which I think is one of the greatest books. But his best book for me is is about Bill Clinton and the Clinton presidency and the making of the president. I think that's my finest book. All right. Well, thank you for that. So now the question you wanted me to ask, where can people find out more about this great book? Well, Iron Genius. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's, you know, it's on any of you, hopefully at all bookstores, your local book re retailer in town, and then certainly on all your online book line providers, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, you know, anywhere you can find the book. And I think that, you know, for me, the, the most satisfaction that I could have in, in this is, is someone like you who's read it and your field of leadership, it impacts you. So that's really what this, this book's about. I find more satisfaction when I get a email from a, a women's basketball coach that read the book and, and likes the book than I would from somebody in the NFL who read it. Well, they already got it figured out. They're not listening to me anyway. <laughs> that's right? so true. Um, sorry. Well, I'm, that's not a comment about them. That's a comment about human nature, right? So nah, that's it, so it, true. You know, I, I I say to my wife all the time. You know, it's weird. I've gotten, you know, a lot of a lot of interest from other teams and other leagues, but very few from NFL. It's not kind of I. It's probably if they're reading it, they've taken the jacket off. I don't think they want anybody to know they're reading it. <laughs> well, that's and, and you don't care. You don't, don't care. care that point, right? All right. So, um, hey, everybody, before we go, now that I have a question for all of you listening and watching, and that is, uh, now what? What are you going to do? Uh, besides buying a copy of Gridiron Genius, the real question is, what can you take from the last 35 minutes of this conversation that you can apply in your work as a leader? Because if you don't do that, this might have been interesting. Um, even if you go buy the book and read it and you're a football fan, it's going to be interesting. You're going to have a hard time putting it down. But my real challenge to you isn't just the interesting stuff and the anecdotes of which there are, but it's the lessons that you can take as a leader to make your work as a leader more effective because that's at the end of the day why Michael wrote the book. And that's definitely at the end of the day why we have this podcast is so that you can become the leader you were born to be. That's why we're here every single week with another episode. I hope you'll come back for another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast.